I was born here in Cambridge and spent uh, about 15 years of my early life uh, growing up in Somerville across from Foss Park and then the South Shore in Holbrook, uh, two Canadian parents. So uh, not only uh, do I have dual citizenship, I'm bilingual, I can speak both American and Canadian. <laughs> Um, and there's really no difference. It's just if I speak Canadian, I just apologize for every slide I show. Uh, okay. Um, so the, what I'd like to do uh, with the time we have today is basically uh, orient you a bit to the region that I'm from, the, uh, uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe, as it's called. Uh, and that's probably a term that's not widely known uh, outside Canada or the region, but it basically refers to a kind of a nickname it picked up because of its horseshoe shape. And, and golden uh, because of its uh, great agricultural lands and, and the, uh, being the manufacturing uh, center of Canada. I'll give you a very brief highlight of uh, the kind of planning system in Ontario so perhaps you can get a bit of an understanding and uh, appreciation uh, of the role of the province uh, in planning and its relationship to lower tier or municipal governments. And if I use terms that may not be uh, domesticated here, please put your hands up and I might be using some some terms that I thought were transparent but may not, may, not, may not be, and then talk a little bit of the development of the plan because I think there's a bit of an important history there of how it came to be and some of its uh, overriding policies. And then, uh, as Armando said, I'll speak a bit to uh, implementation because that's what we're fairly obsessed with right now. Um, but just by way of background, where the Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure, it's kind of a, 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 kind of a not a very romantic title, uh, but it came about recently, about a year ago, uh, merged the two ministries of energy with the Ministry of uh, Public Infrastructure Renewal because Ontario is, is, is for a number of reasons, going through uh, a reinvestment and renewal of its energy uh, capacity and infrastructure in the province. And the ministry, the previous Ministry of Public Infrastructure was as well a more recent uh, creation which uh, with this, uh, this new government, when they came to power, they took the capital financing and um, planning function out of the Ministry of Finance, merged and, and took us out at the Smart Growth Secretariat. We were housed in Municipal Affairs and Housing, put us together. So I guess the upshot of all of this is it's great to have one minister going to bed uh, worried about the uh, sustainable energy, the infrastructure investments that the province is undertaking, as well as the long-term strategic planning. So at least in that one brain of, and very uh, acid-filled stomach, uh, we have you know, the kind of a, a nexus of uh, 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 bringing together a policy. And there has been a tremendous uh, increase in infrastructure in the province in the last couple of years. We probably spend about $6 billion a year normally uh, the last, this fiscal year and next, we'll spend a total of $23 billion, mainly owing to uh, major investments in transit as well as in stimulus capital. <coughs> but to orient to you to uh, where I'm from, the Greater Golden Horseshoe, of course, has the city of Toronto uh, in its center, and it is surrounded by a highly urbanized uh, area, again, surrounded by a 1.8 million acres of protected green space called the Green Belt, which uh, this government uh, established about four or five years ago, uh, basically uh, adding together uh, some previously protected lands but expanding it. Uh, and then, of course, then we have the so-called outer ring. Um, and, and the delineation in governments there you see are, are either large cities or uh, what we call regions or county governments. Uh, and underneath those, uh, there will be a series of uh, lower tier governments. Uh, right now, there's about 8.5 million people, and it is growing uh, tremendously uh, by about 3.7 million people, we forecast, and 1.8 million new jobs by the year 2031. And that is fueled primarily uh, by immigration. Uh, and in owing or at least contributing to the complexity of our task, that region is very large, about 12,000 square kilometers, um, encompassing some... Uh, 110 separate municipal governments. As I mentioned, it is uh, diverse. On the one hand, very urbanized, as you see from the city of Toronto. Uh, but there's also uh, a lots of smaller, or still large cities and mid-sized cities, uh, places like uh, Waterloo. Uh, uh, you may know it from the home of Rim and, and, and the world of Blackberries, but also our steel city, Hamilton, 
uh, which sits at the kind of corner of the horseshoe, our steel town, if you will. And of course, we have our Oshawa, which is kind of our version of Detroit um, and auto manufacturing. But it is also surrounded by some of the best agricultural lands, certainly in Canada, and natural features such as the Niagara Escarpment, which is a U, uh, UN World Biosphere, as well as the Oak, Oak Ridge's Moraine, which is an important uh, recharge area. But I mentioned immigration, and uh, I, this uh, slide um, is somewhat surprising to people. Uh, basically, it says 46% uh, of the current residents in Toronto were born in another country, uh, and that compares to about 27% uh, in New York City. Now, grant you, there's a bit of a numerator-denominator issue there and the, the kind of historic patterns of immigration, but nonetheless, uh, it does uh, speak to the attractive nature for uh, immigrants to come to Toronto because of its diverse nature and the fact that there's well-established immigrant, uh, immigrant communities. Um, and the other thing I'd comment about uh, Toronto immigration is that uh, it is a fairly diverse immigration base. If you were to take a look at the top four countries of or, uh, origin, about 25% of New York's immigrants come from their big four. That number lowers itself to 15 in Toronto, and that's just, again, owing to the fact that uh, more countries or people from more countries uh, uh, come to the city of Toronto. And again, that's a great source of our, our, our growth pressures and our, our, and our opportunities. Uh, it has been fueling growth. It will contribute to about 80% of that growth I talked about to the year 2031. And obviously, it is susceptible to short-term economic fluctuations. But if you look at the long-term pattern, um, it almost is self-sustaining in terms of its uh, its attractiveness and, and, and kind of a self-magnet uh, for the world, which speaks well to our, our future economic development. Uh, in terms of our housing starts in the, the region now, the stats I have here are for the greater Toronto area. We've got so many acronyms or names for our little places, but this would be the underneath of the green belt, if you will. Uh, we've been averaging about 40 to 50,000 starts uh, since the year 2000. Uh, about 60,000 in the whole region, and they've uh, basically have uh, maintained uh, throughout. There was, a sh of course, a short dip uh, with the recent economic downturn, but they're rebounding uh, incredibly well. Um, two observations I would make here. One is uh, we never had or experienced any issues with subprime mortgages. We didn't really kind of have to go through that phase at all. We have this kind of quaint Canadian tradition of lending money to people who have a hope of paying it back. It's, uh, um, which, uh, you know, not to be glib, but that it, it was owing, I guess, to the Canadian financial system uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the starts in the region weren't artificially, if you will, accelerated or propped up. The other important note I would uh, make is uh, since the beginning of 2000, if you look at the dark colored slide, about 78% of our housing starts are multi-res. Uh, compared to about 30-some uh, percent uh, in the U.S. Now, grant you that the U.S. Uh, starts are, are nationwide, uh, but nonetheless, uh, particularly in the cities of Toronto and that inner ring, a tremendous uh, uh, investment in multi-res construction. That's not to say that uh, everything certainly has been rosy in the region. Um, this uh, slide, while about 10 years old, basically demonstrates that our two rush hours, uh, which used to exist from about 7 until 8 in the morning and then 5 to 6 or 7 in the evening, um, our rush hour is now about 13 hours long in the region. Uh, there's no let up in, uh, in, in traffic and we do, gridlock is uh, a tremendous cost, uh, both socially in terms of time of travel and lost time with uh, family and friends, but also economically there's been a variety of uh, uh, studies uh, undertaken that this could well have cost, I think conservatively, our economy about six billion dollars year, a year in lost productivity. Uh, so it is a real issue. Um, in terms of land use planning in Ontario, um, obviously the project I worked on is the biggest and therefore the most important, very central as you can see from the slide. Um, <laughs> but really the province uh, is uh, constitutionally responsible for municipal local government. Uh, and over the years it has uh, delegated uh, a lot of the planning decisions to municipal government.